Well, hello everyone. Um, first off, I want to say thank you so much for joining the Transition Summit featuring Brad Blair. I'm going to be presented by the Star Center. Also, I want to say a quick thank you to Miss Kathy Simmons, who is our um, interpreter for the evening. Also, we do have live transcript is on, so please make sure that you see that. We are so excited that you have decided to join us for the Transition Summit. You could be doing anything else absolutely anything else, but you decided to stay here, hang out with us, and be here for the Transition Summit um, featuring Brad Blair, so thank you. With that being said, throw us some love in the chat. We want to make sure the chat feature is working. We also want to hear where you guys are from. I think we have some from Kentucky. We have some from uh, all over Tennessee. We want to know where you are tuning in from. So let me tell you while you're chatting, let me tell you a little bit about the Star Center. In 1987, Chuck and Margaret Dumit were looking for resources, technology, and disability services for two of their children, George and Angela, who were diagnosed with Batten's disease and began to lose their eyesight. They traveled across the nation to find something to help their children and landed in California. But California wasn't home. Uh, so they brought those resources, connections, and technology to West Tennessee and founded the Star Center in 1988. We began with two clients, George and Angela, and last year we served over 4,100 clients. Um, we began with assistive technology and have now expanded our services to also include music therapy, speech therapy, employment, home care, vision services, and now assistive technology, our, th that department serves all 95 counties in the state of Tennessee. I hope I'm going at a good speed for Kathy. Let me get a thumbs up. Okay, good. To say we've grown is an understatement, but we couldn't have done it without all of the people like you who believe in the mission of helping any person with any disability realize their potential. That's why we're here, right? Okay, I see we have people from all over Tennessee, Kentucky, we've got Chattanooga, um, Southern Maine. Now that's cool. I like that. Awesome. If you guys have any questions for any of the panelists during this time, please be sure to use the Q&A feature and not the chat. But if you want to spark some, spark some discussion, really like something someone said, post it in the chat because we love engagement. So at any time, um, our panelists can answer those Q&A, but we will have a 15 minute Q&A at the very end of Brad's presentation. Also, if at any time you need help with technical assistance, shoot an email to Lindsay at the Star Center and someone is putting her email in the chat right now in case you have any issues. We also wanna say a big thank you to Tennessee Technology Access Program for helping us provide this Zoom event for free in order to continue serving informative sessions. So in order to continue doing that, we do need a couple of things from you. Please answer the survey at the end of this webinar. And if you don't see it then, answer it in the follow-up email. We're also gonna drop our links to our Facebook page, Instagram page, then also our Facebook group in case you guys do want to join in. So guess what? It is time for our first panelist. And let me go ahead and get there. Oh, perfect. She's already turning on her video. Guys, this is Dr. Hillary Travers. Um, she is a senior research associate and principal investigator of Transition Tennessee at Vanderbilt University. In order to help Kathy out, we're actually going to put her entire bio in the chat. That way you guys can get a chance to get to know Kathy. I mean, uh, get to know Hillary. So Hillary, take it off. Had to get unmuted there. Um, thanks, Cassidy. So um, as Cassidy mentioned, I'm Hillary Travers, and I work at Transition Tennessee. Um, our website, um, I will pop it in the chat, but just because of my multiple sharing screens, I might not be able. And I think some of my coworkers are on this um, call, so they might be able to drop it. It's transitiontn.org. And today, I'm just going to share pretty briefly some of the resources we have available to educators, providers, students, and families. So if you've never heard of us, um, Transition Tennessee is a partnership between the Department of Education, the Department of Human Services, Vanderbilt University, where we are housed here in Nashville, and the Vanderbilt Kennedy USED. 
We are tasked with providing training and resources to support and improve transition outcomes for all youth with disabilities for the entire state of Tennessee. Um, we do a lot of technical assistance and outreach all over the state, but we also have a website. It's that one I mentioned, transitiontn.org, and it has three main sections for educators, providers of pre-ETs, and students. Uh, Pre-ETs, for those of you unfamiliar, is uh, pre-employment transition services. And on the right is a screenshot of our website with our three gears. We're actually gonna be updating our website, um, but that is what it looks like right now. And there is a section for families that it's hard to see in the picture. Um, but if you go to that website, you'll see that there are resources specific to families. So today, again, this is gonna feel brief um, and maybe a little quick, but I really encourage you to check out that website, take some time to explore and see what resources might be helpful to you. Today, I'll just review that we have courses that were designed for transition professionals. We have a resource library. We have archived and up and coming and new webcasts. We have archived virtual transition fairs. We have a family resource guide and we do have an entire student website. So those courses are an in-depth learning opportunity. These were specifically designed for educators and providers of pre-employment transition services or pre -ETs. And they cover transition related topics and best practices. So there's a screenshot on the slide of some of the educator courses. Um, some of them include addressing transition in the IEP or guiding principles of transition generally. So these are courses that are composed of multiple lessons and they're a deep dive into content. However, these can be viewed by families looking to deepen their knowledge, especially as students are joining the transition age group, their students are turning 14 to 22. This is a great way to learn some more about this process and what they might wanna know coming into those IEP meetings or starting to meet with their transition team. We have a resource library. So every course has materials and resources that can be downloaded. Each course you can find those materials, but if you're wondering about the materials across all of our courses, you can go directly to the resource library. You can filter and search by topic. Um, and we have on the screen just a sample of some of the resources we have there. So the transition bill of rights, family tip sheets that cover things like assistive tech, diploma options or SSI benefits. We have financial aid charts and we have a post-secondary readiness tip sheet. And again, these are just some samples. There are dozens and dozens of resources in this library. We have webcasts. These happen monthly and cover a wide range of topics all related to transition. They air live every month and then they're sent to those who register. So if you're not able to attend in person, that's no problem. Um, you'll still get the link to be able to watch them. And if even if you didn't register, all of the webcasts are archived on our website. So you can go to the website and click on our virtual options and webcasts, and you'll see everything we've ever done. Um, past webcasts, just three recent ones, have included steps to building financial wellness. We did a webcast in partnership with the Tennessee Disability Pathfinder about connecting the dots to transition service supports. And we did a webcast on embracing the dignity of risk in the transition process. So that idea of letting students with disabilities experience failure so that they can learn from their mistakes and overcome those challenges. We have archived virtual transition fairs. So we're here today at a virtual transition fair um, and we have five that are on the topics that are listed on those screens. So I'll just read them out. We have one on post-secondary education supports, one on the college application supports, one on employment programs and resources, one on independent living resources, and one on inclusive higher education programs in the state. And that uh, archived webcast, or sorry, virtual transition fair on inclusive higher education programs was older, so it won't include the two new programs that have joined our state. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to incorporate that and you will see the information about them, um, TSU and Dyersburg State in some of our other resources. We have a family resource guide. Um, again, we have an area all for families where they can learn information about helping their child prepare for life after high school. We have a downloadable form that can help them to organize information and resources. It helps them to keep notes, um, document their questions, any other details they might want in the different areas of transition they should be considering. So finances and benefits, family and caregiver supports, employment, healthcare, those are just some examples. And then the last thing I want to touch on is something we're really excited about is our student website. This is an interactive web portal that has activities and lessons to teach students about transition related topics. 
there are two pathways that students can choose from. They can either select, I want to go to work or I want to go, um, what does it say? I want to continue my education. Um, and students can choose whichever path they want at any time. It just helps to sort the lessons within these different pathways. There are role play scenarios that are interactive and have a game-like element. It's like a choose your own adventure book where students can choose answers that will dictate the path or the course that the characters take. There are these get involved activities where the students have opportunities to practice what they're learning, both in school and out in the community. Um, and it really encourages students to connect what they're learning in those courses to real life situations. And then all of the lessons can, um, can incorporate these quick pick games. So these are extension activities for students to play at home with family and their friends. It's a nice way to keep families in the loop about transition content. So on the screen is just an example of a quick pick activity. It's a Twitter activity where the student is gonna summarize what they've learned in a single tweet. So I know that was quick. It was just a brief introduction to our website and I'm seeing myself on camera and realizing there's a sunbeam in my face, I apologize. But if you want to learn more, again, our website, transitiontn.org, um, you'll register for free and all of those resources I shared are free. And if you have any specific questions, you can email us at info at transitiontennessee.org. It added artistic effect, I will say, Hillary. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Please send some love to Hillary in the chat and thank her so much for this presentation. We appreciate it, Hillary. And now it's time to introduce our next panelist. We have Ben Schwartzman. Really looking forward to Ben um, coming on. So let me tell you a little bit about him. But right before I do that, we have people from Canada, from Texas, from Georgia, lots of people on here. So uh, Dr. Ben Schwartzman is with the Parent Project and he is a senior research associate in the Department of Special Education at Vanderbilt University. And with that being said, Ben, take it away. Great, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. I wanted to share about our uh, Tennessee Employment Pathways Project, AKA the Parent Project, and our goal is to support families in pursuing paid work for their adult family members with disabilities. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about that today. So. Like I mentioned, our purpose of the project is supporting families and um, in uh, creating this project, we held focus groups with families and uh, professionals across the state. And we really learned about how families find out about information about employment and it's finding out from other families. So we really wanted to create this project to help families connect to one another. Um, families who are just starting the employment process, we wanna connect them with families who have already been successful in finding paid employment. We're trying to connect those families to one another. So um, who's a good fit for our project? So uh, specifically we're interested in parents or other family members could be cousins or uncles. Um, we have siblings on, in the project as well. Uh, so family members of adults with autism or intellectual disability. And what we provide for families uh, in joining the project. So every family member who signs up, they uh, can they're eligible to complete four classes that we call a short course over Zoom, where we talk about different employment related topics. So those classes talk about um, how to match someone's interest to a particular job, how to navigate the service system, connecting to uh, VR services or connecting to ECF choices. And then what programs in Tennessee are available for um, individuals with disabilities and supporting them in finding employment. And then our last courses on uh, the topic of what is the family's role in uh, connecting with employers and how involved should they be in that process. So uh, we really provide families with a step-by-step -step process of how to connect to, to paid work. And then what we're really looking at is uh, those connections, like I mentioned, between family members of uh, employed adults already and family members of unemployed adults. So um, after completing those uh, four classes, parents are randomly assigned to either receiving uh, check-ins with us from Vanderbilt or receiving check-ins from um, a parent who has an employed adult with uh, autism or intellectual disability. So we're trying to see if those mentorships really give an extra boost in helping people find employment. And then that ongoing support is for one year after the completion of those four classes over Zoom. So we also provide everybody who participates in the program with uh, what we call the Roadmap to Employment. And this is a 25 page guide with various sections on 
all of the steps involved with finding a paid job. So from how to figure out what you're interested in to how to figure out who can help you apply for a job, who can help you on the job, who can help you uh, prepare for an interview, and then what to do once you get the job, who can help you uh, be successful and keep that job. So uh, we've outlined all the steps uh, of that process and uh, we have a lot of resources in there that, that we share with families as well. So um, how can families participate? So we have actually our next group of sessions is starting up in October. And these sessions are held over Zoom, uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or Thursday evenings. So I mentioned there's uh, four sessions in each of our courses. So that would be four consecutive Tuesdays or four consecutive Wednesdays starting uh, the second week of October. And we still have spots available. Um, and uh, I noticed a lot of you are from outside of Tennessee. Unfortunately, this project is just for Tennessee families right now. We're hoping to expand uh, nationwide at some point, but um, if uh, those of you that are Tennessee families and you're interested in participating and maybe you're not sure if you can make October sessions, we also have additional sessions that will hold uh, in January through uh, May. And then uh, in addition to those families of adults who are looking for jobs, we're also looking for um, family members of employed adults to serve as mentors in our project. So. Um, just to share what we expect from our mentors. It's nothing, uh, you don't have to be employment experts or anything. We just wanna be able to have those families share their success stories with other families. So some of those uh, challenges that they might've experienced along the way and just being a sounding board um, for families that are just starting out in this process. So kind of being cheerleaders and encouraging and supporting, uh, navigating this tricky uh, service system and uh, also, just any of the ideas that they might have from the roadmap, just helping them apply some of those, uh, helping think about how to connect to some of these programs and resources that are available in Tennessee and just problem solving anything that comes up. So again, we're uh, looking for families uh, of both employed adults and those who are unemployed across the state of Tennessee. So just as long as you live in Tennessee, uh, you can uh, qualify for this uh, program. And again, it's uh, completely free to participate and we provide stipends for uh, families to, uh, who participate in the project. And then how to connect with us. So if you're interested or you know someone who might be interested, I have um, flyers that I'll, I'll post in the chat right after this. You can also send me an email at ben.schwartzman at vanderbilt.edu and I can enter that in the chat. Uh, we also have a website that describes each of the aspects of the project, um, employmentpathways.org. I'll put that in the chat as well. And um, yeah, let me know. Uh, I'll stay on at the end if you have any questions and happy to answer any questions you have in the chat as well. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, that was such a wonderful resource. Thank you to Ben and Hillary for presenting. We greatly appreciate it. Again, if you have any questions for Ben or any, any of the other panelists, go ahead and submit them to the Q&A feature. Thank you so much, Ben. We'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Up next, everyone, let me go ahead and get me back here. Okay, so up next, we have Miss Annette Graves. Um, she is a life coach, advocate, and former classroom teacher. And also, we have Katrina Van Buren. She's a wife of 15 years, mother of two, autism mom, and licensed educator for the state of Mississippi. And they represent the ARC of Tennessee. So let me go ahead and get their videos started. Bringing on Miss Katrina and Miss Annette Graves. Please give them a warm welcome in the chat. Thank you guys so much for being so engaged in the chat, but don't forget to submit your questions. Take it away, ladies. All right. Hi, you all. Thank you again for inviting us. We um, have a pretty quick presentation as well. So let me make it big for you. And everything in this presentation, just to tell you up front, we can always um, give it to you via email or in any other way that you may want it. But again, we are from the ARC Tennessee. We are a nonprofit organization and we focus on empowering individuals with disabilities and their families through their education journey. So what happened was the, the 
Tennessee Department of Education recognized that there was a need for families and schools to become more engaged and to work more as a team. And so what they did was awarded the ARC Tennessee a five-year grant project, five-year grant contract um, to help increase family engagement and to help improve and support the positive student outcomes in special education. So what we do is we provide families and school districts with vital resources, any type of information that's needed and other trainings to help build their empowerment or help close the communication gap between the schools and the families. Because as, as research has shown, families that are more involved, their students' educational outcomes are always improved, are always successful. So that's what we do. And this um, slide, again, is just another snapshot of it, just you know, a little bit more prettier on the flyer. Mm -hmm. But it just shows how we provide trainings to educators, how we develop family-friendly resources. There are a lot of information that come out from the state that can be so hard to read. And so what we do is we'll try to condense that information into what's called family-friendly language, where families can understand um, the information that they are receiving from the state. And again, the outcome is always good where the communication is approved, the relationships are strengthened, and the families are more satisfied at the end because they're more informed. So what a grant was, the grant, originally it was my director doing all the regions all over Tennessee, but now there's eight family engagement specialists all over Tennessee in which it we each have a specific region. So my region is Southwest region, which has Jackson Madison in it. The Star Center is in Jackson. Um, but here's just a list of my regions that I serve. And Miss Annette is the Northwest region. She has a plethora of regions that she served as well. So that's just kind of give a snapshot of the ones that we um, serve. But we also have five other family engagement specialists Mid Cumberland, Upper Cumberland, South Central, East Tennessee, and and South East Region. And so again, with each one of these regions, you can reach out to them. Their email address is on there. If you're not sure which one you fall into, um, their email address is on there, and you can reach out to them. And Jennifer Priya again is our director, who oversees all the regions. And so I'll turn it over to Miss Annette to just give a little snapshot of some of the few things that we do to support families and schools. Good evening, everyone. The ways we support families and schools. We support families and schools by hosting ongoing special education disability related topics. We hold ongoing discussions about all these topics. We connect families with the Department of Education and other community organizations. We host community events, workshops, and trainings for all stakeholders. We provide support and resources on our website, which is familyengagementtennessee.com. And we also have a toll-free number that's listed as well. As Katrina said, we, we turn the state documents into family-friendly resources. And next slide. And one of the things right now, we'll also be hosting a community conversations event this month, September 27th, at the Star Center at 5 o'clock p.m. All right, family outreach community. We can help schools to be a link in the community, and we host informational booths at events, transitional fairs. We provide parental support during parentage information nights, doing IEP meetings, and we use surveys to find out what the needs are for families in the communities and throughout the schools. And we use that survey to determine what type of workshops we're gonna conduct. We also develop a list of local and state services and providers that can help address the needs of the family. Sorry about the lag. I'm not sure why I keep doing that. I just wanna apologize. But we're all about bridging the gap between the family and community and the schools. And we know we can bridge that gap between those uh, entities. It makes a stronger, successful family team. 
All right, family outreach and networking nights. Now we have we have to develop parent support groups, transition fairs, and I told you about community conversations. And these conversations are being held all across the state of Tennessee. If you go to our website, you'll find a list of all these various community conversation nights. We support family engagement nights by providing a range of topics. Once we get those surveys in and hear from our families, we have a range of topics that we can use. We discuss diploma options, ECF's choices, and the list goes on and on. All right, ways to connect with the Arc Tennessee's Family Engagement Project. We're on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We also have a, a active website. And on this website, you also sign up for our newsletter as well. And there's a, a screen there. If you have your phone and you want to sign up right now for the newsletter to be abreast of all the great things that are happening in Arca, Tennessee, in the Family Engagement Project, and across the state of Tennessee. So I know that was pretty quick. And again, we just wanted to give a snapshot of the Arc Tennessee. And for this little last slide, we have two things. First thing is um, if you can scan the QR code to do our survey, we like, again, like to get all type of feedback from how we can present better, um, what information you're looking for um, that in, your, in your area or in your region. So if you can um, do the survey. And right now we are giving away the complimentary membership for the Arc Tennessee because we want you to stay connected with everything. So if you can scan the QR code for that, but if you can just drop your emails in the um, chat box, we can always give you a copy of the presentation. So we thank you for that. All right, give it up for Katrina and Annette. Guys, thank you so much for presenting on the Arc of Tennessee. And I know there are a lot of people here from other states. There are several, correct me if I'm wrong, several ARCs in every, are they in every state or in, are they worldwide? Yes, there are. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are um, local and national. That's awesome. Guys, thank you so much. Um, appreciate uh, Katrina and Annette doing, doing this. So, all right, up next, we are going to be bringing on someone that I know very well because she works right down the hall. So um, she started off as an OT, but now she is a um, vice president of client, client services at the Star Center. So she pretty much oversees the assistive technology at the Star Center. So let me go ahead and start her video because we're going to do a little Q&A. Everybody meet Jennifer Cunningham. Her bio is posted in the chat. <laughs> All right. Also, um, Katrina, someone needs to stop sharing their screen. Excellent. Thanks so much. All right, Jennifer, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Glad to have everybody with us tonight. All right. So first up, um, what is assistive technology? So that's a very good question, Cassidy. So assistive technology can be any sort of thing that is um, purchased off the shelf, is made, is um, used for something maybe that's not typically used for, um, but basically it's something that will increase independence um, and safety for someone with disabilities. So that could be um, in, in going to school, whether they're you know elementary age or college or beyond, um, or whether they are um, in the work workplace or, or looking at going into the workplace and just um, in general as uh, uh, for life um, itself. So most, most any way, any, anyhow, we can make, um, make things uh, into assistive technology. And I know I actually use a piece of assistive technology, which is my favorite piece of, piece of assistive technology, which is the live scribe pen, um, but is assistive technology expensive? Well, not always. And so that's um, sort of a myth of assistive technology that it is always going to be expensive and it's always going to cost hundreds or thousands of dollars, but that is not true at all. And um, Cassidy had mentioned the live scrub pen. And so that's a good thing to bring up in a transition um, meeting. Um, and so if you don't, know about the live scrub pen. I'm going to ask Lindsay to put that link there in the chat. 
um, because whether you have a disability or not, the last graph can, can be an awesome tool for you, especially for those kids. We see a lot of kids over the summer transitioning into college. But um, more recently, we had a gentleman who came in. He had um, glaucoma and just putting a pair of yellow solar shields on um, for him to wear indoors and outdoors just made a huge difference in his um, ability to function, to drive, to um, read papers in front of him, things like that. So, you know, $30, $40 or less, it just was life changing. So. So it doesn't sound, I'm going to jump questions. It doesn't sound like assistive technology is difficult to use. It does not have to be. Now there are technologies such as um, screen reading software or um, speech to text type software that sometimes takes some additional training um, or ongoing training or updated training. But for the most part, there's a lot of things out there that are very easy to use. And um, last question, does assistive technology help people who do not have a disability? Well, I'm gonna turn your question around a little bit, Cassidy. Okay, I like it. <laughs> here more recently, um, we have um, found some tools that are made for people without disabilities that have become um, really sort of um, neat technologies for people with disabilities. So. Um, here in front of me are um, bone conducting headphones um, manufactured for runners, um, people who exercise a lot. And so they sit right in front of the ear instead of um, taking up the ear canal. And so um, the sound is conducted through the bone. Um, so they still have their ears to hear traffic or um, someone else talking. We recommended them recently for a little second grader. Um, who still needed to be able to hear her teacher talk, but she needed to hear her technology talking to her as well. So, um, so a lot of times we find other things that are not for people with disabilities and, and find solutions for people with disabilities. Awesome. Guys, if you have any questions related to assistive technology, please send them in the Q&A feature. Um, we might be able to address a few things that um, you guys want to know. And also, we're always open for questions at any time. Uh, please let us know. I know everybody that you have heard from today, they're a great resource for people with disabilities, whether you're a parent, an educator, a VR counselor, whoever it may be. Um, everyone here, I feel like, has been a great resource. So, Thank you so much, Jennifer, for um, telling us a little bit about assistive technology. All right, before we have our main event, we are going to take a brief break. Give Kathy a minute just to get some water and take a break. So guys, um, run to the bathroom, get some water. We're, we'll be back in around a minute or two minutes and you just get ready because Brad Blair is going to blow your mind. Thanks so much, guys, and I will hear from you soon.
All right, guys, welcome back um, to the transition. It is time for our main event. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Tim before I turn on his video. So um, just a reminder, we have a 15 minute Q&A session after this. So Brad works as an orientation and mobility specialist, a vision rehabilitation specialist, and an assistive technology instructor at the blind in Charlotte, North Carolina. Guys, we're going to put his full bio in the chat, but please welcome Brad Blair. Let's start his video and unmute. And see where he is. All right. Guys, send your love in the chat for Brad Blair and uh, welcome to meeting you now. Take it away, Mr. Brad. Okay. All right. First of all, am I in the camera correctly? Yes, we're good. We can see you. Okay. Okay. So every time one of you puts a chat through, my screen reader is going to read it and everybody's going to hear it. All right. Good evening, my friends. It's good to be with you. Uh, before I get started talking about who I am, which is not important, and what I have to say, which I hope is, I want to give a little love to our ASL interpreter. I have studied sign language. I used interpreters to do it, and I know how hard that job is. So thank you. I actually hope we have some ASL users actually benefiting from that. So, all right. Y'all just have to live with my screen reader. So why am I sitting here? Good question. One possible answer is that with all of this talk about transition, I have actually done it. I have had IEPs and I have had to live the transition from high school to what comes after. Having said that, I'll give you a couple of disclaimers. I'm not going to claim to be an expert on any disability except mine. Although I will claim some knowledge of deafness and deaf blindness uh, because I studied them, but once you get outside of those areas, I don't claim to know any more than anyone else who has not had close contact with it. I will refer you to the resources and the presentations that you have previously seen for more detailed information and for experts who can assist you with very specific questions about your child or students or clients situation or your situation. As to the rest of it, if I could boil down everything I am going to say into one word. That word would be self-advocacy. Self-advocacy. Here are some facts. When you are a child with a disability in a K-12 educational setting, you are, or at least you should be, surrounded by a team of people who know you and who know your disability as it relates to your educational supports. Let me use blindness as an example. You have people teaching you Braille and producing Braille for you. If you're a Braille reader, I am. You have people producing tactile graphics. You have 
people who are helping bridge the gap between very visual explanations of things, such as in geometry or the hard sciences, uh, to explanations in those modes where you can make sense of them, tactile, kinesthetic, verbal, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. I'll go you one further. If you are deaf, you probably, and say you are profoundly deaf and an ASL user, you probably have deaf and hard of hearing teachers involved. ASL interpreters throughout the day, et cetera, et cetera. If you are deaf blind, it gets even more interesting. Point being, you have a whole team supporting you that understands your needs. When you leave high school, that team vanishes and you find yourself moving through environments where people don't know you and don't know your disability and who are not about to do the research for themselves and who do not have the job of doing the research for themselves. And so it comes as a shock if you are not prepared. For example, I have known many young blind folks to graduate from high school or say a school for the blind, go off to college and fail miserably, not because they weren't smart enough, not because they weren't driven enough, it depends on the person, but because they had no idea how to navigate the college experience as a blind person. Totally different from the high school experience. Maybe nobody told them. Maybe somebody told them once and they were asleep that day. Maybe they just didn't remember what they had been taught, but they were not prepared. And if you should happen to fail college, I, I don't want anyone to do that, I do. Let it not be because you were not given proper information about how to conduct yourself as a student with a disability. Now, fair warning, most of my anecdotes are going to relate to college. I've attended four universities in two different states. I know a little bit about it. And I have a couple work-related anecdotes for you because what I just said about school also applies to work to an extent. Okay. So let's deal with some of those differences more concretely. You step onto the college campus, but before you got there, did you register with the Office of Disability Services or whatever it is called? Did you meet with your assigned coordinator at the Office of Disability Services and thoroughly discuss your accommodations. Let's use me as an example, say Braille, audio materials, extended testing time, etc. Do you know what a letter of accommodation or LOA is? And do you know that you have to give these to each of your professors? And that if you fail to do so, they are not required to accommodate you in the slightest. Yeah. That, that's a lot before you even get to day one of the semester. Yeah. And more hypothetical questions. Did you realize that you have to register for your classes well in advance because disability services is probably going to need the lead time in order to make your materials accessible. So you don't get to, for example, get a week into the semester, drop the college algebra course that you were taking and sign up instead 
for intermediate level underwater basket weaving. You have the freedom to do that. But if you do it, you run the risk that the Office of Disability Services providing these supports is not going to be able to catch up or may catch up slowly, putting you in a catch up situation. And that is a bad place to be. All of this that I just went through in the form of hypothetical questions are very concrete reality to the student in the college setting. They have got to know about these realities. They have to understand that there is no IEP here. There is no 504 plan here necessarily. There is an office mandated by the ADA, which will provide approved accommodations, but it becomes your, the student's responsibility to see to it that those accommodations are in play. Does the student know how to advocate for themselves? See, here we are, self-advocacy. Does the student know how to make their needs known? Does the student know how to have follow-up conversations? Does the student know how to communicate effectively and politely between university professors and the disability services office? It takes a bit of diplomacy. I have not always been diplomatic. <laughs> Take that as you will. All of these skills and all of these facts should be taught to your client or student or child before they graduate high school. These need to be discussed because surprises in this situation are not going to do you any good, them any good. You're out of it. Let's talk about work. It so happens that I have a job. Uh, many blind cannot say the same, and it is unfortunate. That's a whole other conversation. This is actually not the first job I've had. But let's talk about employment accommodations. Is the person going out into the workforce aware of how those work? Well, I'm here to tell you the answer is not always. The person needs to be aware, for example, of when and how state vocational rehabilitation will support workplace adaptations. For example, installing a screen reader or screen magnification software onto the workplace's computer that the person is gonna use and even scripting that screen reading software so that it works with the workplace's proprietary databases and other proprietary software. If this is not navigated successfully, the worker with a disability will not be able to do their job. I have known of blind people who lost their jobs or had to leave their jobs when for example, workplace systems and softwares were updated when the screen reader was not updated because nobody wanted to pay for it and the person did not know how to get it paid for through the state. And so the person was no longer able to perform job functions. It happens. I hope it doesn't happen to me. I don't think it will. I have known blind people who have talked to me about their job interviews. And they would say to me, they didn't know about JAWS. I had to explain it. Of course they didn't know. The employer is not going to know our assistive technology, unless of course you are working in the blindness field, but they're not gonna know. And so again, it becomes your job and my job to be our own advocate. 
we not only have to tell the employer what we need, but we need to do it in a way that doesn't leave the employer thinking that they're on the hook for $10,000 just for hiring us. That's a good way not to get employed. So again, has the client done their homework in advance? Do they know how state VR does these things? Are they coming into the interview prepared to allay these concerns? Because rightly or wrongly, these concerns can prevent us and folks with other disabilities from getting jobs. One work-related anecdote. I once worked at a candy store. It was a part-time job and state VR where I was living was not really going to support that. I knew that. I had no idea what the store manager knew about blindness or such things. But I came in with strategies and ideas in hand. This is how we can make the candy case accessible. This is how I will know one box from another. This is how I know where these items are stored. And I was hired. Now, it so happens that that manager had previous experience in her lifetime with employees who were disabled. But employer attitudes are a whole other conversation. Point being, I was prepared to have those conversations and I came with those answers before those questions could be asked. And that is what we have to do. We have to be not only as prepared as our non-disabled counterparts in the workplace, we have to be more prepared. That is the sad reality of the situation. Getting back to the school environment, I will tell you one other story. I think I still have a good amount of time. I'm gonna, Cassidy, do I still have some time? I think I do. Yep, you sure do. Okay. I'm gonna tell you an example, uh, the most striking example of disability related accommodations that I ever needed and for which I had to advocate and strategize myself. If I had not been in the brainstorm, this would not have happened. I was getting my master's degree in this field, and I clearly did not have enough to do. That's a joke. So I said to my disability services coordinator, somebody who had been working with me for a year and who understood my sense of humor, I said to her, you know, I have a hole in my schedule. I think I'm going to add something. She goes, what? And I said, I'm going to add sign language. And she sighs and she says, you would. And then she says, okay, let's see what we have to do. Three months later, we did it. Now, I won't go into all the accommodations we used. Um, in fact, I wrote an article about them in the Journal of Visual Impairment and Blindness. Suffice it to say that I worked with multiple interpreters every day in class and out of class. I taxed the interpreting services of my university to their limits and we made it work. But we made it work not because I made a last minute decision to take a class, but because I decided months in advance that I was going to do this. And because I came to the table with my ASL instructors and my disability services coordinator and the head of the interpreting services unit with ideas. Some of my ideas were good ones. In some cases, they had better ideas. But we put our heads together and we put our ideas together with the bottom line being that I'm going to participate in ASL to the extent possible, as much like a sighted person as I possibly could. And that's what we did. Don't try that at the last minute. That's all I'm gonna say about that. So as I work my way towards wrapping up, 
I want to come back to the theme of self-advocacy. Oh, and I'm, and I'm going to share a resource in closing. I've shared a number of stories about what, what I've seen people do and what I have done. And the self-advocacy never stops. When I was hired on at my current job, these people had every expectation that I could do the job. Even so, we brainstorm. How can Brad best do this? Getting around this area, for example, do I have a volunteer driver? I wish. What I have are about five different methods of getting around these three counties. Oh, my email's not working currently? Everybody else's kind of is? Hmm, true case. What are we going to do? We're still brainstorming. It's, it's a never ending process. Just because you got into the program or got the job doesn't mean that the self advocacy stops. It never stops. So don't get tired of it because you're always going to be doing it. Now, when I was asked to do this, I was asked if I could recommend a book for you guys. And I chose a book called Life After High School. And I'm going to put a link here in the chat here in just a second. And it's a guide for trend. It's a transition guide for parents, and counselors, and students. And it is, as we say in my native state of Tennessee, it is chock full of resources and information concerning everything about the transition process. How do I take the ACT or SAT accessibly? Oh yeah, I had to do that. Uh, how do I deal with college? How do I deal with work? How do I, you know, how do I get along with concomitant disabilities, uh, including many disabilities that I will not claim to know anything about beyond what I've studied or learned, you know, from even from reading this book. Uh, so I believe the Star Center maybe is going to give out some copies of this. Uh, but in this book, these authors, Susan Yellen and Christina Birch, refer to a website. And let me... Close, open, more options for participants, button menu, question and answer, open chat panel, open the website that I'm going to send you is called the Yellen Center, Y E L L I N Center. So Susan Yellen, one of the authors. Chat text list box. Who to see your messages? Recording on button. Zoom and raise button, drop the file button, drop down, emoji button. More chat options, but input chat text type message here. Edit. Okay. HTTPS slash slash www.com. You can raise HTTPS. I think I did that right. Hey, if you didn't, drop it too. What's up? If you, for some reason, didn't go through, we'll, we'll send it in the chat. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to send it in the chat. Okay. So that, that link that you are going to see is the website of one of the authors of this book. The book itself is 11 years old. So it's a little bit, you know, dated in terms of when it was written. As far as I know, there is not an updated version. But as far as I know, pretty much everything in the book still applies. So if you haven't had enough resources, here's one more. It's a nice little thumbable uh, handheld book that you can skim through, taking what you need and leaving the rest to one side, which I suspect is what the authors intended. The website of the Yellen Center may provide additional resources if you have a specific situation that needs to be addressed. So in conclusion, as I, I feel that I'm getting close to time, uh, in conclusion, I just want to say one final time that whether a student is transitioning from school to work or high school to college, or college to grad school, or transferring from one college to another, or college to work, whatever the case may be, self-advocacy is going to be their most vital tool. And in order to advocate for themselves, 
successfully, they're going to have to have the knowledge of the facts of life when it comes to the college environment with a disability, the workplace with a disability, accommodations, et cetera, et cetera. They're gonna to have to know that information and they're gonna, and, and that's where you come in. And they're gonna have, have to know how to use that information. And that may be where you also come in. So role play with your students, role play with your clients or children, make them pretend that you are someone who doesn't know about their disability and that they need a particular support in the classroom. How would I explain Braille to a professor or that his handouts are gonna be put into Braille? How do I explain to someone why I need extended testing time? Because believe me, that student is going to have to explain it. I want to thank all of y'all for playing along and listening. I want to thank the Star Center for the opportunity to chat with you tonight. I look forward to your questions, at least the ones I feel like I can answer. That's a joke. And uh, so there we go. Thank you very much. From many to everyone, thank you so much, Brad. Great presentation and great information. Would love to hear you at some time. Your screen readers are about to go crazy. Just letting you know. <laughs> let me mute myself. Well, um, I will say yes. Yeah, so thank you so much, Brad, for bringing up the books. We are going to send the link for the book um, in there. And that is one of the incentives for you filling out the survey um, is we're going to choose three to five people, depending on how many, how many of you actually fill out our survey link are actually going to get a copy of the book, but it's not that expensive. So thank you so much, Brad, for actually choosing a book that is not crazy expensive because we know things are a little out of hand. Um, but I'm going to give everyone a second to submit their questions and also send some chat, um, chat features. Cause I know it was so wonderful, but we didn't want to bother you too much with the screen here. So we'll give you guys just a quick second. Second, and then um, I'm going to bring the other panelists on, and that way we have some questions to answer everybody. Okay, so give me just a minute. Okay. Bringing on Annette, and Ben, Great. And where is I'm trying to find Katrina? I guess Katrina had to hop off. No worries. Jennifer Cunningham, hold on one second. Awesome. Thank you guys so much um, for presenting at the Transition Summit. So we actually do have some questions. Don't forget to go ahead and submit those um, that have come up. And actually, some people have emailed them as well as to not to disturb you during your presentation, Brad. That was wonderful. Thank you to all of our panelists. I believe we have tried to send as much information in the chat as we possibly could. Um, also, this webinar will be available on, on the Zoom webinar on demand afterward. It does have to take time to process, but we will make sure that information is sent out. It will be available for 30 days on the Zoom webinar on demand, and we're hoping as all goes well that we will be able to get it up on YouTube as well. And there's some great resources in the chat, so we should be able to send the chat feature out um, as well. I keep saying as well. I don't know what the sign is for that, but it happens a lot. All right, so I've got a couple of questions. Is that what it is as well? Perfect. I was thinking of also, but I also. don't think it is. Wonderful. Okay, so um, Brad, I'm going to ask you a your question. Or you're the first one up. So, how sh soon should a student meet with the university's disability services? Okay, uh, I was turning on my mic. Can you repeat that question? Yes. <laughs> how soon should a student meet with the university's disability services? As soon as possible. Do you, if you mean this is my freshman semester, when should I be having these conversations? Uh, you should be having them over the summer. So you've graduated high school. It's fine. Uh, you know, enjoy that. But I would say by July, you need to be talking to disability services because you're going to have to fill out paperwork. Maybe send in some reports, get a you know get your accommodations in place. Then you're going to have to go through the ordinary steps of 
meeting with your advisor. I happen to know some good ones. And uh, dealing with, you know, what classes should I take? You know, same experience as everyone else. Uh, but once you have that class list in hand, you're going to be marching back to disability services and saying, hey, I'm taking underwater basket weaving this semester. Uh, you know, how do, you know, I, I need to get accommodations for it. Can I, can I get someone in there to help me weave? Uh, it's an exaggeration. Uh, so yes, because by day one of the semester, you want to be thinking only about basket weaving not about the accommodations that will help you to weave baskets. And so when it comes time for spring semester, you will probably have early registration. Uh, a lot of universities have early registration for uh, students who are registered with the Disability Services Office. You better be taking advantage of it. You better be finding out your book lists in advance and having those conversations in advance. So for spring semester, you better be having those conversations in early November. So the more lead time, the better. Brad, I just wanna say, this is Jennifer. Um, as you were saying that as soon as possible, you know, June, July, whatever's the soonest, Ben and Hillary were both nodding their heads. <laughs> and uh, Miss Annette as well, just, yes. I think there was lots of uh, concurrence with that <laughs> as soon as possible as soon as possible. I mean, especially if you're going to take underwater basket weaving. <laughs> That's a tough course. Um, funny story uh, for my career day in high school, my senior year, um, I actually dressed up as an underwater basket weaver, flippers in tow. Nice. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, okay. So follow up to that question and anybody is welcome to chime in. Um, so would having their final IEP paperwork from high school be beneficial I see lots of heads nodding. I can start um, with the information I know. So if you are planning, it depends on the type of university that you're going to. I would say generally, yes. Um, as Brad mentioned, the IEP does not get honored once you leave high school, but it can help the Office of Disability Services to understand the types of accommodations that can help you to be successful. If you are somebody or you are a parent of somebody or a teacher of somebody, or a provider of somebody who wants to go to an inclusive post-secondary program, there are different requirements for paperwork. Many of them will require an IEP, um, and ideally an IEP that is the most up-to-date. So not one from ninth grade, but one from your year of graduation. Um, again, it helps to set the expectation for what accommodations have been successful in the past and what might be used in the future. For technical colleges and community colleges, I don't know as much information, to be honest, about what their expectations are, but I never think it hurts to have that IEP document with you. Have your summary of performance that you should have from your last year of high school and bring all of that with you to any Office of Disability Services to make sure you're getting the supports that you need. Excellent. Ben, you want to say just something? To, add to that? Yeah, just to add to what Hillary said. So prior to this, uh, my position at Vanderbilt, I worked at a community college disability services office and um, it always helped to have the copy of the IEP uh, when deciding on, uh, it, like what Hillary was saying, gave us a good picture of what accommodations worked in the past and what uh, we could provide uh, in college classes. And um, along with that, just needing that um, either a doctor's note or some kind of a medical form is usually what is needed to get those supports in place in college. Awesome. Okay. That's super helpful. Um, Brad, I got a question for you and we got a couple questions for other panelists as well, but Brad, first up, what age did you first meet with VR? What age did I first meet with uh, a vocational rehabilitation counselor? Oh, I, I was trying to understand the question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, like what, what is meant by AIDS? Like, what did they do? Oh, age, A-G-E. Oh, age. Sorry. Okay. Maybe I need a tactile sign interpreter over here. Um, <laughs> Kathy, you're in the wrong, wrong place. Um, <laughs> Southern, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm a Tennessean. I have no excuse. That's true, that's true. I first met with a VR counselor, I want to say, during my senior year. So I guess I was about 17. Uh, now, in my particular case, there was no doubt that I was going off to college. 
So in, in some respects, some of those questions were already answered. But yeah, I was 17. Start my senior year, I'd say. Okay. Awesome. And um, here's a question for actually no that one. Everyone, everyone, the baby pick up so it's at 14 years old. A question for Ben. Have you ever considered doing a project months. outside of Tennessee at some point because uh, they would like to participate? Yes, we've gotten uh, a lot of presentations that we do. Uh, we get a lot of requests from out of state and we would love to, to do that as a next iteration of this project. So we have two more years left on our current funding and then um, after we uh complete this it is, it doesn't part of the project we are uh our hope is to we're, we're calling it a road show is we're hoping to take this project on the road so uh we'll we will definitely be reaching out at the end of, uh, going beyond tennessee Awesome. And then, um, Annette, will you drop the link? Um, I know we had the QR code up there. Some people didn't get a chance to um, scan that before the slide went away. So do you mm -hmm. have the link to that survey? Can you post yes, I can put that in the chat. Wonderful. Um, also, speaking of survey, so the survey that we were talking about where you could potentially win a book that we were mentioning earlier. So that is a survey that helps us provide these types of informative sessions for free, and that is because of TTAP. So we will choose um, random winners to win the books. Um, so please fill that out at your earliest convenience. It'll pop up at the end of the webinar, but also we've, I believe, put the link in the chat as well. And then also, all right, so we've got a couple more questions. Hold on, let me pull them up. Let's see. This one's from Vicki Pate. Okay, hold on. As a provider of services who wants to reach college students with disabilities, we have found an obstacle in reaching them to offer pre ETS because they must self identify and many do not. Any advice on how to reach the ones who do not register with the Office of Disabilities? Not all at once. Maybe. I mean, here's the pessimist answer that um, if a student needs to register and just refuses and won't do it, some people have to hit rock bottom and fail a few classes before they get it straightened out. That sounds a little harsh, but I think it's also a little true. Do you think maybe some students or parents are just unaware of the options out there? Is there need to be more of some self, like some awareness about the program? I wonder what my other panelists have to say, but maybe. I think awareness of pre in schools is something we at Transition Tennessee are working on to make sure families know what services their children with IEPs are entitled to. So if it's um, not K through 12 because pre-ETS is transition age. So I think this was chatted about a bit in the chat. Um, Brad may have gotten hooked up with a VR case manager at 17, 18, but it can start at 14. So pre-ETS can start in middle school. Um, we would love to see that in every middle school in Tennessee. It's just a matter of staffing and organization and lots of other things, but it can start at 14. When students leave school, to be honest, I don't know much about pre-ETS um, in terms of what we're calling pre ETS outside of high school. I would, I've always thought about it as pre ETS is high school. And once a student leaves high school or turns 18 and they're leaving their IEP behind, if they need those employment services through VR, they're assigned or they can apply for a case manager. It's a referral process. Um, and they would get hooked up with someone specific that can help them with employment supports, job coaching. Um, resume building. So those pre ETS skills, but for adults, it's no longer the pre-employment transition skills that we think of as school-based. Um, and in the school age, students have to have an IEP. Um, that is a rule that pre ETS has stated. So to the question of if a student isn't identified, if, if a family doesn't want the child to have an IEP or have the label of disability, they will not get services so again, to Brad's point, I imagine it's similar in college. You will not get VR services unless you self-identify. That's part of that self-advocacy. You need to identify yourself and ask for the supports you need. All right, just gotta get the word out. Sounds like it and get people more comfortable with um, being able to self-identify. Thank you, Annette, for dropping the link in there for you guys. Okay, another question. Anyone's actually, um, 
welcome to answer this. What is your most used favorite type of assistive technology? Brad, why don't, why don't we start with you? <clears throat> Let's see. <clears throat> I wonder if a guide dog would be considered assistive tech. I think mine would consider that insulting. Uh, let's see, the guide dog, the long white cane, my screen reader, my braille display, my braille books. And for those of you that um, have not had a chance to see Delaney at all, she is. Come here. There she is. <laughs> Come here. Come here. You might have to bring her up to your chest. Okay. Come here, girl. Come here. Who doesn't love a dog on a Zoom? <laughs> she is how old now, Brad? 11 and a half. Oh, everyone, that is Delaney. That is Brad's guide dog, who's been featured many times that Brad's been featured on the news as well. Um, we appreciate that. Okay. Um, ben, Hillary, Annette, have y'all have y'all used this technology at all? I, uh, I'll have to second year one of uh, the live scribe pen. We had those at the community college and I was a student. It was very popular with students. We had a few that uh, got checked out at the office and they were just always. So yeah, definitely the live scribe pen and the notebook that goes with it. Yes. Um, also, I'm seeing in the chat. Um, so if you guys are interested in the ARC survey uh, email, um, actually, we just put the correct one in there. Um, so you can send out an email, but there's also the correct link in there as well. Love the live scribe so much. All right, Jennifer Cunningham, I'm going to put you on the spot. What is your favorite piece of assistive technology? From everyone. Thanks. Forgot to unmute. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. Um, there's just so many neat features that are built in now, I think, to technology. And, and who knew when I started in this field 20 plus years ago that we'd be carrying computers in our pocket that would be fully accessible to somebody with lots of kind of kinds of disabilities. So I think I think that's probably the, the number one. Love it. All right, we got one more question um, before we wrap everything up. So anyone's welcome to open this, but Brad, you might want to start. So what is a good way to start the conversation with a new employer about accommodations? If you don't do this, I'll sue. No, 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 no. Seriously, don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, that was my response. <laughs> a good way to start the account, you know, I would probably, I mean, is there a good way? Okay. I would probably put myself at the center of the statement and I would say, so, you know, and I'm going to do this job using this and this and this, which assists me by doing that, because you're educating the employer, right? The employer doesn't know. The employer might not even know that the iPhone in their pocket speaks or can speak, right? So, uh, you know, I might have to really walk into the conversation preempting those questions and almost, almost pitching myself and my assistive technology, but maybe you other folks have some better ideas. Anybody else want to take a stab at the answer? Yeah, something uh, that we share in our classes with parents on how to navigate this issue. Um, and I've uh, worked with students before too in talking about this where um, you don't come to employers saying the things that you can't do. You say, here's what I need help with and here's what I do to help with that thing, if that, if that makes sense. So, um, so you don't just say, well, I have a really hard time uh, keeping numbers straight. And you just leave it at that. You say, like, here's what I use to help me navigate adding things together. I have this device on my phone that I, or I mean, now we all have calculators, but that's, so that's a bad example. But um, I had uh, just an example. One student had a really hard time um, with spatial orientation, remembering where things were in the store. So what they did was they said, um, I have this map that I've created that I carry around with me that's color-coded and it helps me remember what aisles have which items. 
and it's just kind of saying like a statement not saying is that okay for me to use it's here's the issue here's the thing i use and this helps me and it helps all of us when it helps me so um yeah see, it see ben like said it better than i could it sounds like yeah. self advocacy is one of the biggest things that we can um, communicate with other people and something we encourage, which is tough, but it is something that I feel like is very needed. Um, there is one question that was, uh, we did answer it um, in the actual question. Hold on, let me find it. I just lost it. Wait a second. Wait. Oh, here we go. Um, Brad, this is specifically for you. What do you feel are your best soft skills that you bring to the table in addition to your self-advocacy that will be beneficial in employment to college? Now or when I was that age? Um, Is it both? Yeah, no, no, it's not both. Trust me. <laughs> now I would say my hard won ability to be diplomatic and collegial, as well as my active listening skills. Uh, being able to do those things goes a long, long way towards breaking down barriers. Awesome. Love that. All right, guys. Um, I hope it looks like that we have, um, wait a second, we've got a funny question. Oh, no, I'm asking it, Christy Elliott. Brad, have you been able to find any good chicken livers in South Central Avenue? Uh, yes, actually. <laughs> the Landmark Diner on Central Avenue serves whole platters of chicken livers. And uh, you could drop my email if you want in the uh, chat, the Gmail. Yes. Fine. Yeah. Yes, I have found good chicken livers. I haven't found a peanut butter burger, though, Jennifer. Oh, wow. Okay, we just dropped uh, Brad's Gmail in the chat as well. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to all of our panelists and our keynote speaker, Brad Blair, for taking the time out of their day. Um, I've, I learned a lot during this session. I hope that you guys did as well. If you continue to have questions, um, please feel free to shoot us an email. Uh, you can actually send an email to info at star-center.org we will send it in the chat um but if you ever have someone's email address in the chat or whatever it may be we will direct you to the person um we hope that you found this informative and we would love to hear if you want more things like this and if there's any other topics that you would find interesting so please fill out that survey, um, please fill out that survey. So that way we can uh, do more stuff like this, uh, thanks to TTAP, the Tennessee Technology Access Program. And I feel like Kathy deserves a round of applause for her hard work as an ASL interpreter. Thank you so much um, for that. Brad, thank you all. If you have anything else, feel free to shoot us a message. But I hope everyone has a wonderful Tuesday evening, that it is beautiful weather like it is here in Jackson, Tennessee, and that everyone has a great rest of the week. Thank you so much for um, joining the Transition Summit, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.